Hey, you guys, welcome into Video Bebop Presents. I am Cedric. This is the special Video Bebop episode where we give you guys special access to things like documentaries and live performances. And today we have something special for you as well. Today we pre present a documentary from Astor House called Stay Well, Stay Awake. These guys wanted to do something special to commemorate their 10 year anniversary, but it morphed into something a little different. Yes, COVID had a lot to do with that, and we all had to kind of learn on the fly due to COVID, but nonetheless, these guys were able to put together something really special for you. So Video Bebop is so happy and so proud to provide this platform and show you guys this documentary. So without further ado, here is a documentary from Astor House called Stay Well, Stay Awake. If you have stumbled upon this film, you are probably asking yourself, what the hell am I watching? Who the hell are these people? Everything we've captured in this film was a complete accident. This documentary started out as a fun project to mark our 10 years as a band, but quickly changed directions. Midway through filming, the world was hit by COVID-19. As we were interviewing musicians and local businesses, the subject matter drastically changed. The interviews turned into a discussion on mental health and what it was like to be a musician during these troubling and uncertain times. The musicians and business owners you are about to see have had to put their careers on pause, allowing for deeper reflection. Before the virus hit, many musicians were caught up in the numbers game, judging their worth based upon the success of their product. Now they've had a chance to get in touch with the deeper love of their craft without worrying about the receptions from the outside world. These circumstances yielded candid, revealing interviews. There has been a power and resilience in our interviewees. It has been amazing and inspiring to capture it on film. Join us as we peer into the hearts of Seattle musicians and stay well, stay awake. We began filming for this project back in September of 2019 with a very different vision of how the final product would look. Originally, the project looked a little more like this. However, we realized that leaving any of the original edits would be too confusing and too disturbing to some viewers, so we decided to take it all out. Three people you will be seeing a lot of in this documentary are myself, my brother Russ, and our bass player Julio. The three of us comprise the band Astor House. Like many musicians around the world, we had big goals for 2020. We were set to release our first full-length album and tour to support it. With the virus spreading quickly, all live concerts were halted indefinitely. We used to play several shows a month, and now, at the completion of this documentary, we haven't played a single show in 11 months and counting. We had lost something so special to us without knowing if it would ever return.
According to the World Health Organization, we are now in a global pandemic. Western Washington is the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic that's sweeping the nation. Three new presumptive positive cases. 400,000 people who have died. Death toll rising daily. It affected the entire world. Lost more than 1,300 people. Our state has shut down. The decisions that we're making are going to be profoundly disturbing to a lot of the ways we live our lives closure today. Of schools, of hundreds, the closure of schools, hundreds, of restaurants, just all the Who are you? Now that is one of the most difficult questions to answer. Who are you? Oh my God, really? Who are you? During lockdown, I've had lots of time to think about that. I'm a person who likes to drink a lot of wine. I'm Patty. I'm Patty. Who we are is a, is a work in progress, but we do have names. Who am I? I ask myself that all the time. I am completely gobsmacked by that question. I don't know. I applied for a senior citizen's card in Australia. So I had to make an appointment go into the, sh uh, the uh, office. And when I sat down in front of them, they said, can you please prove who you are? I said, I've been a monk over 46 years. For all that time, I've been trying to prove who I am. And I still haven't finished. She said, I, I, I need to have your ID. So can I see your driving license? I said, I don't have a driving license. Well, let me see your credit card. I don't have a credit card. Your bank account details, I don't have any of them either. Your rental agreement, I don't have any rental uh, properties. What about your marriage certificate? I said, I'm not married. I'm a monk. I don't have that stuff. <laughs> so she was very upset at me. <laughs> and said, so, well, you know, according to us, according to the government, you don't exist. I said, ah, that's the answer. I cannot prove who I am. In late 2019, we had started collecting footage of Northwest musicians with the goal of creating a snapshot of the Seattle music scene. After months of quarantine and introspection, we decided to continue forth with our documentary, but this time with a new purpose to connect with artists trying to navigate the new world. During the filming, we journeyed across Washington State, California, Virginia, and as far as Western Australia, reconnecting with old friends and making new ones along the way. So first off, who the hell are you? Who the hell am I? <laughs> um, my name is Jonathan Plum. I'm uh, a co-owner and a producer out here at Leonard Bridge Studio. The studio was built in 85. I started working here in 1990. That's who the hell I am. You know, the studio is famous for uh, Pearl Jam 10 did their first record here, and, and uh, Mother Love Bone did all the recordings here, like Apple, and then Alice in Chains did Facelift, Jar of Flies, Sap, uh, Temple of the Dog, Blind Melon, uh, Soundgarden, Louder Than Love was done here, which is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, so the whole grunge movement, you know, like like majority of that stuff was done, yeah, in that building in there. So COVID-19 has, well, it shut the studio down. As things developed, you know, initially started out really slow, or like there was some dangers, don't worry about it, and we were still doing sessions and in closed spaces and now i think back on it and it's like oh that was really scary because we did some sessions with quite a few people in these little teeny spaces and because we didn't have the information or the knowledge to know that that was dangerous when it started it's like oh next week or next month it'll be fine and and i think we all need well i've realized now this is not this is not going away before the virus we were poised to go on a 50-day national tour called the spread the love tour we were going to start at South by Southwest. We were hearing about the, the coronavirus, like, oh, okay, I'm sure we'll be fine. Then it started getting more and more serious, and then South by Southwest canceled. 
and that's when we're like, this is real. You know, we were going to do Jam the Van. It was just going to be the set-off point. And we were still talking, should we still go, still go? I'm like, dude, it's over. It's over, like, it's over, you know? And everybody just took a deep breath and kind of just wallowed. I remember for about three or four days after the news, I kind of was just numb. Like, I can't believe our national tour is over. I can't even go make other shows. What are we going to do? My name is Eva Walker. I play in a band called The Black Tones. I host a show on KXP called Audio Oasis. My ocean moment was driving down 23rd and everything looked like a ghost town. Like there was nobody outside. And that was the first time where I was like, oh my gosh, like this is real. We're in a real life pandemic. I do the morning show at KEXP. I'm also the uh, audio program director. I'm extremely worried about the ecosystem of our music community. I really worry about the musicians and the, I should also say, the industry that supports musicians, be it anyone from sound to roadies to, to bookers to managers to uh, tour bus drivers to, I mean, if you start going down the road of what it takes to do a live show, we're, those people are in big trouble right now. And it's when this is over, they can't just hop back into this situation. People no longer have the escape of, of work or of hanging out with their friends to avoid what's really going on in the world um, and avoid the things that we've been talking about in our music, specifically with Black Lives Matter protests and anything regarding things that we need to do to improve the lives of the marginalized. Honestly, it's it's super scary owning a small business and you know people see all these gold records on the walls and they think, oh, we're, we're millionaires or something, but it's like, man, we... You know, this is a passion project and, and uh, we put everything we have into keeping this place open and so to get shut down for three months is, you know, it's, it's uh, catastrophic. Our second record for Acid Tongue was supposed to drop on March 13th. That was the week we went into lockdown super hard. It's hurt even shipping records to Europe right now. Stuff's getting held up at customs in a different way than it used to. I sent out all of the acetone vinyl months ago, and it's still in San Francisco on our side, you know, just lost in some shipment, you know, who knows, knows what the f is going on. And the things like the unemployment that a lot of the artists on the label can claim right now, and, you know, it's been a godsend for debts. Uh, but it's screwed up, man. You know, I should be in Japan right now. And I'm in my backyard, you know, talking to you guys. I think this has caused, and I hope it causes people to really, really understand how fragile our music ecosystem is. It is always on the edge of going under. Every artist struggles. A very, very minuscule percent of them can make a living. We as a community take their music and we don't pay them. We don't support them. The clubs that are open, they are dying right now. But if you like live music at all, you have to do everything you can right now to support musicians. And if we if we blow this, it's, it's going to be a problem. I was just remember driving and the reality kind of hitting me of this might be the rest of your life. This might be another 10 years. This might be another 50 years. I have no idea. I hope me and the people that I love come out on the other side of it. Like that reality hit me. Dumbass. Dumbass. Take the damn son of a bitch and money, you b What the hell do you want? Do I look sexy? She brought me water. B you dumbass. But it's warm as p. I'm going to church. Yes. Jennifer, you can't go up Main Main Street is My name is Sheila Lilinquist, and um, I live in Northern Virginia. I'm Grandma's granddaughter, and Ginga is my great aunt. I'm just normal everyday person just like everybody else who happened to start videoing their grandmother and it kind of blew up by accident you're so damn dumb it's funny kiss my ass our mom died suddenly six years ago and my it was our mom who took care of grandma um the last 30 years when our mom passed away i promised grandma that I would look after her like my mom had. 
I would go make lots of trips back to West Virginia where she lived. And of course, anytime I went there, Gingo would come up because they saw each other every single day of their lives. She will learn she's a real pain in the ass. I'd like to kick her in her ass. She's full of shit. I started listening to them, their banter, and it was making me laugh when I didn't think I was going to be laughing at anything. And I would send little snippets to Frank, and he started putting them on his Facebook, and his Facebook just blew up. And he said, we got to get them their own Facebook. I can't have all these strangers, you know, messaging me and whatever. We started getting calls from Jimmy Kimmel and you know, Steve Harvey and, and Frank would say, you're not going to believe who just contacted me. <laughs> wow! <laughs> to be honest, um, I think it's really taken its toll on her because she lives with me. You know, she was used to going to church every Sunday with me and she'd see all the people that she knew from when she lived with my mom during the winter. And so she would really look forward to that, seeing all her friends. But now I can't take her anywhere. And she's she watches the news so she knows something bad's happening, um, but she forgets daily. So, but she hasn't seen Ginga for a long time because Ginga's hunkering down in West Virginia with her family and grandma's stuck here with us. So she was five, I think, during the Spanish flu. So she remembers her mom speaking in Italian, saying il flu, you know, and there are a lot of young people dying then. 1919 is when Ginga was born. So it's a miracle they're both still here because they both survived that pandemic and Ginga was born during that pandemic so I mean she was a baby and so Ginga has no memory of that but grandma does remember lots of people being sick you know grandma likes being out and about and and so I've noticed her slowing down so what's taking Alright, so as you can see, we have two computers. One works, and one is a decoy. We started with all of our footage on this one. But when we put all the footage on, the computer would not turn on. So then we transferred everything over to this computer. One day we go back, and we had edited for months, and all gone. We still had the original footage. Edits were gone. Bad, semi-good, turned into bad news. We have tried everything to make this work, and nothing is helping. We've turned to somebody much smarter than us for help. Everything will work exactly as it did before, but just a little bit better. As oh long God. as God doesn't strike us down. I, I can't imagine the process of making a documentary. It just sounds like too much work. We found and that then out. Editing oh everything God. together <laughs> yeah. and like actually figuring out how do I want this to work for an out like for however long it is, making sure that you're telling it the right way, <laughs> cutting out all the bullshit. <laughs> oh my God. Be honest. Do you like us? Would I do this for you if I didn't like you? <laughs> so we are going to keep pushing through and hopefully get this out this decade. So wish us luck. We are going to need it. Has COVID affected your mental health at all? It's been an interesting ex human experiment. And I've, I feel like I'm just sliding by this whole thing. I'm going to get like a C plus when this is all over, <laughs> which is not great. <laughs>
I'm gonna mention in the documentary that I look terrible that way. People will be like, okay, cool. She knows she looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> I worry a lot. I'm a worrier. So a uh, pandemic is, is not good for a wor worrier <laughs> at all. <laughs> but I've been, you know, scared that like my family members will get it and not react very well to it. Um, and so that scares me. And so I, I do think about those things. It's kind of thrown us all for a total loop because there is no playbook for, you know, how to be a musician during a global pandemic. And um, I know even for me personally, like this has taken more of a toll on my mental health than I ever expected. And I've always thought of myself as like a strong, badass chick that can handle anything. But, you know, this really has been a challenge for, for all of us, even the people that, you know, we've always felt like we're strong people. Um, this is something that's kind of breaking us down a little bit. I'm a pretty anxious person, and so one that knows me might think I would have freaked out about it or something, but I just felt way less alone for the fact that it was happening to an entire world. Um, I was like, well, it's happening in Brazil, and it's happening in Japan, and it's happening everywhere. I stepped into a management role, so I, I still work in music, and I work for a management company, so even though I'm not playing as much, I still kind of logistically help those pieces fit. Nico Case and I have been friends for a long time and she is my longest client of almost eight years. So I toured with her for the last, for a year. So that was kind of crazy, just jumping back into um, touring and managing and having, you know, a family at home. I got to go to New Zealand and Australia. And, and so I managed her. And then I recently uh, started looking after Josiah Johnson from the head and the heart. One of the things that's, that's super cool is that the Seattle music scene has been, you know, I mean, it's like decades and decades and decades of incredible musicians. So I don't just love rock music that's from everywhere. And I don't just love rock music that's from Seattle, but I'm very lucky to live in a place where our music is so much of the fabric of, of the city. I'm Nicole Swims, that's who I am. We're called Blackens, we're from Seattle, and we are a trio. And I can't play shows, obviously. I've been, I was playing shows so much before the pandemic hit. So it's been a really weird change. It sucks, it's really bad. I have to say I feel lucky, and I know that I'm, I'm luckier than other people that are dealing with this right now, but I miss doing live shows really bad. That was my favorite thing to do. So it's really messing me up there. <laughs> with this queen, when I think about it now as the person I am today, I'm so glad that I took all of those van rides. We drove all around this country like dozens and dozens of times when we're like, do you think we could make it to Minneapolis from Austin to like, sure. I mean, it's not an easy job to like be a freelance musician or a stage manager, or a production manager, like all of these things take a lot of stamina and determination and drive to watch people having to like really recalibrate and figure out how they're going to put food on the table is, you know, is heartbreaking on a million levels. About the story, let my sweet son cry it. I could lie about that too to all of you. I became a dead man when I learned to see. Actually, it makes you think about things. Uh, makes me think about what's the future of work look like? What's the future of businesses, uh, business models? So many people working from home. And all of a sudden I'm assuming companies are like, why are we renting that huge building downtown? We don't need it. But then are the downtowns going to become ghost towns? And then do you need cities anymore? It really has ma makes you think about some kind of deeper things.
without a question, this has affected my mental health. I don't know. I don't, you'd have to be like some kind of like frozen statue to not have your mental health be compromised by what's happening here and what you're witnessing in real time, which is people kind of shock absorbing trauma while it's happening and having to kind of like adjust. My entire career has been spent in basically local TV. Um, I was on a show called Almost Live, which was a sketch comedy show, kind of Seattle's version of SNL. And for the past 10 plus years, I've been hosting a show called Art Zone, and it's all about the local art scene. I've definitely dealt with depression and uh, anxiety. First of all, I've been on antidepressant for, I don't know, 20 years. There came a point where I was um, driving across uh, the Aurora Bridge. And I had the thought, and I'd had this before, but I had the thought, I thought, I can just jump off the bridge. And it was very calm. And I told my therapist about it. And he said, well, that's, that's not a thought that everyone has. He wasn't saying it's a crazy thought, but it's not a thought that everyone has. I kind of reached a point in my cyclical depression where I just couldn't see myself pulling myself up by my bootstraps again. So during COVID, I mean, I'm obviously still doing the antidepressant and all that. Um, since I have a propensity towards um, a bit of un that kind of existential angst, what's the point? In COVID and pandemic, it just seems like it's just going to kind of keep going on and, and on. Where is the end? There will be eventually, um, but it can look a little bit um, uh, monotonous and endless. And so I just have moments and days. There's days when I just kind of go, you know, the best thing that's going to happen today is that it's going to be over and I'm going to go to sleep and get up in the morning. But I also know um, this feeling is going to pass. Part of my mental health and my depression and, and anxiety um, have to do with the state of the world, the way people treat each other, and pandemic falls right into that wheelhouse. I can't understand that we, in America specifically, um, care so much about a mask or care about these rights that we're not willing to sacrifice anything for the health of people we even know, but let alone don't know. I'd say in the last couple months or so, honestly, with the winter time, I've been feeling very uh, depressed. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't feel mentally as stable as I did when the sun was up. Yeah, we don't even really see Max that often because he's working, um, and he's got to, you know, he's got to stay safe in the workplace and all that. So like, like we're together, we we we're working on stuff, but. We can't even really be in close contact with our bandmate as much as we would like to. I'm glad that we're still doing it and it makes me worried about all the different bands that are in the scene that might not make it through this because this is taking a long ass time and it's a lot of stress on people and I know of a few other bands that are just kind of disintegrating and big ups to anybody who's still making art and still trying to find a way to like, because who knows what the future holds in this city for the venues. My job as a communicator, I like, I'm playing music a ton, but I communicate what's going on and the feelings of that. And so to, to try and touch that nerve all the time is uh, it's just taxing to do that. And to read the, this is how many COVID cases, this is how many people died today. Like, those are people in our community and those are people that are, we would be out mixing with all the time. And now, not only do I not see them because I'm isolated, but also I won't see them again. We had to lay off a huge chunk of our, our part-time staff, our uh, promotions and marketing teams are gone, our events teams are gone because you know, there's no events, you know? Yeah, we took, we took an absolute beating. Things have turned around a bit, but 2020 is gonna be one of the worst years on record for us. And having said that, I feel like an ass, like, oh, we're down 60%. I mean, people, people have lost their livelihoods. People, have, their businesses are closing. You know, we're fortunate that we can weather a storm like this. Like, we're gonna come out of this okay. Unfortunately, that's not gonna be the case for a lot of folks. The mainstay or the bread and butter of what I was doing was working in traffic and doing traffic reporting. And if you remember the world where it was March 2020, it's like a light switch. 
you know, I mean, traffic was really a huge issue for us here in Seattle until March 19th, 2020. And suddenly, highways were wide open. And so as a traffic reporter, my job changed dramatically because it went from having to talk about backups to talking about transit and all of the other things that are still important and still informational. Because otherwise, I had news directors going, well, why, why are you here? Why do we even bother paying you? Whoa, 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 whoa. There's still need for this. It's not about backups now, but it is about the fact that all of these ferry services now aren't working or the airport's canceling this or, you know, I mean, we, we had to find other ways to stay relevant. So there was a big change professionally in what I had to do. This is seriously impacting what it is we do. And, uh, you know, because, for example, we can't have bands come by the station anymore for our live in-studio sessions, which, you know, we get a lot of, uh, a lot of people love those, and we can't do those. So I think about artists, like, let's just talk about musicians, not getting to perform, not getting to get out there. I think that's, that's huge. That's a huge loss, you know, and hard, hard to kind of probably deal with. I consider myself in a, I'm trying to be a professional musician, and a lot of that has to do with touring and stuff, so... You know, when you take all that away um, and there's no foreseeable end, you know, in sight for this COVID situation, it's kind of hard to, uh, I kind of had to find myself again. And I have song, I have songwriting, so I, I still have that, but I'm trying to dis discipline myself to do that every day. So obviously, right now, everything is so f***ed up. Like, I can't even begin to describe everything, all the, the that's going on. Thinking about music these days is, is like a it's like a love-hate thing for me because of just where everybody is, where musicians are because of the pandemic. Some days I'm like, why why am I playing music? Why am I still playing music? Like I had a long period there where once COVID hit, I didn't play drums for about three weeks because I thought it was pointless. I was like, this is why should I be playing drums right now? Because and I, I put so many hours in, but it all seemed for nothing for me because I was like, okay. We're we're fucked. The world's ending. <laughs> we're screwed. Like I don't I don't have any reason to keep doing this. Why should I keep doing this? I did get COVID in April of 2020, which was unlike any time I've been sick. When I lost my sense of taste and smell, that's just when those articles started coming out about all that. And so I was like, okay, I really think I have this. I swore I was experiencing lingering things almost a year afterwards and like problems with my skin or big waves of fatigue and you know you had this new thing that's now been through your body and you're kind of like what are the lasting effects of it? It's hard to know what was just in my mind going on or what was actually going on. In general like I do know some some you know kind of national size bands and you know they're everyone's in the same boat you know I, I don't really know I don't know what exactly the economics and how that works but I certainly know plenty of art musicians that are looking for day jobs now that didn't need to do that before I, I know we're lucky you know compared to a lot of people in a lot of different businesses I know we're really lucky but at the same time you know it's it's crazy scary and we're working our asses off New vaccine supplies bring optimism and hope. Providing the very precious vaccine that will end the pandemic. This site at Rainier Beach and our West Seattle site are being converted into vaccination clinics. This is the culmination of a deadly year-long battle that has affected the entire world. After a long, emotionally trying year, Washingtonians are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Slowly but surely, Northwest businesses are starting to reopen, and the music scene is taking its first breath after a year of silence. On June 4th, we played our first show in well over a year. The pandemic taught us that life is impermanent, passion is a blessing, and love is still the most powerful force on earth. 
Love is stronger than isolation, illness, and fear. While the future of the world is uncertain, the future of love remains unharmed and unafraid. As musicians move into 2021 and beyond, they take with them a deeper appreciation of music. Be normal. This is normal take. Take take one normal. Music is really important to me because it's the best way to connect with other people and then also grow as a person. Music's always been my outlet and thankfully COVID it doesn't have the ability to take that from me. If it wasn't for music, I don't know how much more of a brunt I would have felt from COVID. I am Charles Prim and this is my son Danny. It's interesting, when Danny was young, he had a kind of a rough start at life. He had a, a bunch of surgeries. He didn't actually start sitting up, I don't think, on his own until he was like four years old. One of the first things we did to give him an activity is we put a set of bongo drums in front of him, and he, he immediately took to the bongo drums. So that started, I think, his lifelong love of the drums, and then we moved him to the drum set because I've always had a drum set, and, and we've, he's been playing ever since listening to music, you don't feel so alone or isolated because you know someone else has shared that experience or shared that feeling. Uh, music in its own way is poetry, either through the instrumentation or what the people have to say. They're telling a story and I just wanted to be a part of that scene, both listening, both being there in every way and form. I've basically been singing my entire life since I was about six years old. It's almost like a mood gauge so I can tell how my mental state is doing. It's as attached to me as this left arm. On a community level, it brings people together. It helps us get past our differences and focus more on appreciating what we share in common. It goes beyond culture and language. As someone that lived in multiple countries with different languages, it's nice to have something that I can communicate with other people with that doesn't require me having a full understanding of their culture or their language. It is a universal language. No matter where you're from, even if you don't speak the same language, it connects. It allows people to connect and understand each other in a way that words simply can't. It just gets so many people through so many difficult times, whether it's an artist who has to perform a song just for their own uh, mental health or just the people receiving the music and what it does for them. I didn't really fit in with like the sports doctor, lawyer mold, and uh, I was looking for something to kind of boost my identity and my morale and my self-esteem. Drumming immediately became like the coolest thing in the world to me. I don't know, I've always, I was always like athletic, but I hated competing and I didn't like being on a team, so like the drums made perfect sense to me. One of the most important things about music to me is the community that's based around it, but I've made a ton of the friends that I have now through that just like meeting people to play with, uh, meeting people to hang out with, go to shows with. That sense of community is so important, you know, we all go to these shows and we go to, to perform to some degree so that we can feel validated by our community. I think that it's a really positive thing if you're a musician to, rather than seek that validation sometimes, provide it. Music has been a real solid support for ourselves probably you as well. Music will be with you always. <gasps> hey, we didn't, we didn't know you, you were there. there. Wow, where'd you guys come from? <laughs> <laughs> we're educators and, and uplifters. We, yeah, we're lifters. Just watching people just come into their, into their own humanity, I guess, you know, and watching kids in particular just sort of develop confidence and the passion for music. Now that's, that's you know, hugely rewarding. 
our customer experience uh, really was was different when we were strictly online. And as we've been able to open up again, really been able to kind of bring that back. There's a lot to be said for that interaction between the teacher and the student. One thing that hasn't changed was uh, the commitment of our instructors to their students and their students' well-being. I found my love for music while actually being in quarantine. All this craziness. But after, like, I was just bored one day and just loved music, and I was just like, wow, I want to play! <laughs> and also, it's awesome. Music is one of the purest forms of self-expression and connection that I have ever encountered in my life. It can be whatever you want, as long as you think it's cool. It can be cool to many other people. It's just a raw expression of yourself. You can take a moment where you feel like crap and throw it on a page and show it to someone and say, this is me. I'll have an adult student start and like just barely be willing to sing. And then they just said, I want to do a recital. That's I was like, awesome. what? You yeah, do? That, that's yeah. courage. That's, like, <laughs> that's yeah. like courage yeah. and, and confidence and, yep. and enthusiasm. And you know they and take pride, it into the rest you know? of their lives. I think what has changed in our music industry over the course of the pandemic is that things are a lot more transparent now. There's always going to be issues, but I think there's been a lot more conversations recently about how we can actually change those things and how we can all work together. While COVID was a devastation, it has brought to light the unique connection between music and mental health. Music especially is this incredible journey. I think it, like I said, it's a mistake thinking that you're going to get famous and that's going to make your life better. Focus on as much as possible on the positivity because so much of this industry is drudgery and intense and all of this hard work and you can forget why you're doing it at all and if you get caught up in what it should be, you forget about what it is. I honestly don't even remember why I play music. When I learned how to play guitar and I kind of started piecing together my first bits of songwriting, it was almost like someone dumps out a bunch of Legos in front of you and then you just like build something and you're like, cool, oh, that was cool. Maybe I can build something better next time. Everything is just a very real process uh, and just the evolution of us as musicians, it's just all very real. But it's so rewarding, you know, and to be able to put something together, it's like a, it's like a puzzle, you know, and once you are in, you're just in it, it's just, you feel like your soul is just aligned. I want to give the audience a feeling and I want them to come away and be like, man, I really felt that and I really could relate in an emotional way. There's a branching out creatively of artists and the desire to work with one another. It's cool to see all these artists getting together and wanting to collaborate, but with all these new ideas. What I've really been looking forward to is all the unreleased music and art that I think we will inevitably see from a bunch of artists. Hopefully the next year or so will be really great for our local music. I'm really excited to see how the music scene kind of bounces back. There's going to be a lot of good concerts and a lot of, I think, catharsis. I saw my first show a month ago. It was almost like the last year and a half didn't happen. I'm interested to see how that enthusiasm, you know, the enthusiasm of the crowds is going to play out over the next few months. Obviously you guys have the Louder Milk show coming up. So will this be your first show back? Yeah, first show since COVID and first show with those guys probably since 2007 or 8. I'm just grateful for whatever I get to experience. The only way I can describe it is like you're not playing the music, you just are the music. There's going to be something that we gain from a tough experience. It could make the next wave of the best art we've ever seen. Don't compare yourself to others. Just try to ground yourself in, in what you're doing. I mean, just like be in it. It's important to remind yourself that you're here and that your survival is a default win. Um, okay, hit record this time. Let's actually go. Okay, just testing. Uh, Alright, already I'm gonna hit record. Okay, okay. one, two. Welcome and to my you're nightmare. Good. Has the um this pandemic has this affected your congregation or you spiritually in any way? Nah, it's all the same. One of the nice things when you say about lockdown. As a Buddhist monk, as a meditator, we do lockdown all the time. In the government course at quarantine. 
I call it meditation retreat. So whatever problems there are in life, make use of them. And they get together and just figure out a new way of being happy and living a good life. Whatever happens in this world, you can always learn, gain, grow, as long as you're looking for the beautiful stuff in life. I'm sure that you all remember, if you've been listening to me, the story, I can't keep saying it, about the lady who walking back home got in a big part of dog poo. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say sh**. Oh no, goodness, please I say sh**. Say, <laughs> I, I would encourage you to say worse. <laughs> <laughs> so she tried in the big part of dog sh**. And what did she do? She was a wise, smart woman. So as soon as she trod in the dog sh**, she did not scrape it off her shoes. She left it on her beautiful shoes and brought it home with her. And she only scraped off the dog sh** when she was in her garden under the apple tree. And when she <laughs> scraped the sh** off under the apple tree one year later, her apples were sweeter and juicier than ever before. And they were so delicious that when she bit into them and the juice of the apple just dripped down her cheeks, she remembered what she was really eating, which was dog shit, <laughs> but transformed <laughs> into the most delicious, sweet, juiciest apple she'd ever eaten in her life. And she also shared those dog shit apples to all of her relations and friends and everybody she knew and created so much happiness and joy for hundreds of people. That's My what mouth to do is the watering. Dog <laughs> life. <laughs> Give me some <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh yeah, just go outside and ask anybody. I'm sure they'll be generous enough to give you some. <laughs> and anyway, whatever happens in life, you, know, you just see the positive side of it and just uh, make the best use of the time you have. All oh, these are great opportunities in your life. Yeah, there's more weeds in the garden than there were last week. There's still heaps and heaps of flowers in that garden. So always keep watering the flowers. They get the weeds. And then the flowers overcome the weeds. playing live shows, honestly being on stage is where I'm the most comfortable. Playing live shows to me is always the goal. Man, I miss playing shows, I miss working shows, I miss when your amp cuts out and the whole set's a mess. At the end of the day, no matter what's changed around us, music will always be there. It's never going away. literally means everything to me. It's given me my wife, my daughter. All of those experiences and feelings are all things that I wouldn't have had without music. Music matters to me because it allows me to connect to a community of artists of all kinds. It describes the absolute minutia of what existence is all about, and yet it also describes the grand landscape of everything that's going around you. It's been around forever. It's something that people can connect with. Everything I can express in my day-to-day -day life comes out in my performance. Every bad feeling <laughs> turns into a good feeling. And it's a really, really special part of my life that I'm really grateful for. And we're gonna try and do us some touring this year. And uh, that all got shut down, but you know, it gave us the chance to spend all of the, the touring money to come in here and record instead. I think in the end, it's hopefully gonna work out all right for us and hopefully it works out for everyone else. 
Music is the soundtrack to the chapters of my life. Going through a year without having you know, the influence and stuff of your friends and family and, and just being kind of locked in the basement, having music to not only distract you from that situation, but also remind you of events when you've had fun with friends and family has been like really essential. You're making a statement when you write a song. It's a very powerful tool and it's a great way to let your emotions out. I'm just realizing how much of my life that I had devoted to music. I love everything about it. I love writing it and making it and recording it and performing it. But now as the state's opening back up, I'm surprised at how it feels like not much has changed. It really feels normal again. There's a lot more energy it shows. Like, I think people are just so stoked to be back and experiencing live music again. Like, we really just don't take it for granted like we used to. And you got all all those things you don't even realize you need to say, and then it just ends up being said through your art. I believe everyone has some kind of path that they're meant for, some kind of truth. For me, that's music. The music is a thing that doesn't stop and start when humans decide it is. It's, it's part of the overlying beauty and structure of the world and universe around us, and it's when we check into that thing and we experience it that we call it music. There's a balance between knowing how much you suck and believing in how good you are deep down to, you know, to kind of push you forward and to pull you forward. But to never be satisfied with what you just did, but also not want to give up and to have some faith in how good you are. And I don't know, if maybe it's like it's some of us are just delusional. Maybe I'm delusional. Thanks for watching my film. <laughs> that was a great documentary. That was a great doc. Wait. Wait a second, were you, did I? I may have you? made an appearance in there. Oh, geez. okay. All Thanks right. for watching Video Bebop Presents, you guys. I'm Eva. And I'm Cedric, and please do not forget to bring your color TVs. That's not the same. That's right. That's I true. said it. I said it first. Don't forget your color TVs. Wait, from downtown Blacksville where there's a report of a baby Zilla. What is she gonna do? Ah!